Now, up to this point, we have looked at two nonparametric procedures for testing hypotheses about the median of a single population. The two procedures we've looked at are the sign test and the Wilcoxon signed rank test. The first procedure we looked at, we're now giving the name the sign test. And when we think about how we calculate the value of the test statistic for the sign test, which we're calling x tot, the first thing we do is take the difference between each observation and the proposed value of the population median. In thinking about how we calculate the value of the test statistic from those deviations, uh, we can think about ignoring the magnitude of those uh, differences and just focusing on the signs of those differences. And that is why this test is called the sign test. Now the sign test makes minimal assumptions about the population we're sampling from. In fact, it makes almost no assumptions at all. And so for that reason, the sign test is very broadly applicable. We can apply the sign test really to almost any distribution that we can think of. We can apply it to skewed distributions. We can apply it to distributions that have high kurtosis, in other words, very heavy tails. Obviously, we can also apply it to symmetric distributions. When the distributions are symmetric, we can also apply the Wilcoxon signed rank test. So the, the Wilcoxon signed rank test has built into the development of the procedure the assumption that the population we're sampling from is symmetric, and so its application is limited to symmetric distributions. Now that limitation on its usage may seem somewhat restrictive, and it is, but when it is applicable, when we are analyzing data from a symmetric distribution, the Wilcoxon signed rank test is in general more powerful than the signed test and therefore would be preferable. Now why is the Wilcoxon signed rank test more powerful than the signed test? Well, if we think back to how we perform the sign test and how we calculate the value of that test statistic, the first thing we do is really transform the original data values, which are typically at the interval or ratio level, transform them down to the nominal level, which is the lowest level of data and the least informative type of data. Now, in transforming the data down to the nominal level, we're really getting rid of characteristics of the data that could render a more standard test, like a t-test, not applicable because of skewness or heavy tails or something like that. And therefore, that is one of the reasons why the uh, sign test is so broadly applicable. But the resulting loss of information does cause a degradation in the power of the test. On the other hand, the Wilcoxon signed rank test Essentially what we're doing is transforming that data, which is again at the interval or ratio level, to a lower level, but this time we're not transforming it to data at the nominal level, we're transforming it to data at the ordinal level. Now remember that the ordinal level is one data level higher than the nominal level, so there is a loss of information, but we're not losing as much information as we do when we transform the data down to the nominal level. And because we're not losing as much information, that data is more informative about what's going on in the population. And so that is why the Wilcoxon signed rank test is more powerful than the signed test in those situations when it's applicable. Now again, this limitation on the application of the Wilcoxon signed rank test to situations where the population being sampled is symmetric may seem restrictive and perhaps even overly restrictive, but that's the reality of the situation. We really should not apply that to situations where the population is skewed. But in this lecture, we're going to look at a situation where that problem essentially resolves itself. And this is a very interesting and a very useful application of both the sign test and the Wilcoxon signed rank test. And it's a situation where we're going to be comparing two populations using dependent samples. Now you've already seen this in your first methods class. You would have been introduced to the paired t-test. And the paired t-test is a, a technique where we are comparing the means of two populations, but not with independent samples, but rather with dependent samples. Now the fact that there is dependence among the samples needs to be taken account of in the analysis. We would not want to apply a procedure that assumes independence to a situation where the samples are dependent. If you think back to how we did that procedure back in our first methods class, you'll remember that we essentially transformed the overall problem involving two populations 
down into a single population. So we compared two population means by taking differences between the observations in the paired samples, condensing, this, uh, condensing it down to a single sample, a sample of differences, and then making inferences about the mean of the population of differences, which is equivalent to making inferences about the differences between the two population means that we started with. So again, we transform the problem from one involving two populations down to a single population by taking the paired differences. And that is what we're going to do in this situation as well. We're going to use both the sign test and the Wilcoxon signed rank test to non-parametrically compare two populations. And here is how this problem of restriction of the distribution being symmetric resolves itself. Under the conditions of the null hypothesis, which would say that the two populations are identical, they're the same population, right? There's no treatment effect. There's no difference between the populations. Under that assumption, when we take the paired differences, the resulting distribution or population of paired differences is going to be symmetric. And that's a very important thing and a very useful result because that's going to allow us to use the Wilcox and Signed Rank Test in any situation where we're analyzing paired samples. Because again, under that null hypothesis, the population of paired differences will be symmetric and it'll be symmetric about the median. And in particular, it would be symmetric about zero. So we can transform a problem where we're wanting to compare two populations when we have paired samples or dependent samples to a population involving one population of paired differences under the null hypothesis that population will be symmetric about zero which is the median and so then we can apply not only the sign test but also the Wilcox and signed rank test to those problems so this issue or this limitation of the distribution or population having to be symmetric really gets resolved because of that, taking the differences and uh, looking at the distribution under the conditions of the null hypothesis. Now we're going to start off by way of example. We're going to be comparing two populations using paired samples and we'll start off using the sign test. So the data in the table below are the number of defective parts produced by two different machines on 12 consecutive days. The machines are set up to produce the same number of parts per day the question is, is the defective rate the same? Well, the null hypothesis to be tested is that there is no difference between the two machines in terms of the distribution of the number of defectives produced per day. Framing it in terms of a hypothesis test, is there sufficient evidence at a level of significance that's close to 0.05 to conclude that the machines are different with respect to the number of defective parts produced? So you see here in the table we've got the number of defective parts produced by the two machines across the 12 days and I've also taken the difference machine 2 minus machine 1 so I have the differences listed here. So you might use this data and analyze it yourself with your calculator or possibly with SAS as we'll see here in a while. Okay so if the null hypothesis is true, if the distribution of the defective parts produced by the machines are the same, then the distribution of the differences will be symmetrically distributed about zero. And so we can perform a test about the median of the uh, population of differences to uh, answer this question. So we're first going to do this using the sign test. So the null and alternative hypotheses are the same. We're going to denote the median of this population of differences by cap M. So the null hypothesis is that uh, cap M is zero, that the median of this population of differences is zero and that's equivalent to the machines are the same. All right, the alternative hypothesis is that cap M, the median of the population of differences, is not equal to zero and that implies that the machines are different with respect to the distribution of defective parts produced by the two machines. Now, as you know, if the null hypothesis is true, then the test statistic x tote has a binomial distribution, in this case with n equal to 12, corresponding to the 12 days, and p equal 2.5. And so the next slide shows what this sampling distribution looks like. It's this binomial distribution with n equal to 12 and p equal to 0.5. Now if the null hypothesis is true, then we would expect x tot to take on values from 3 to 9 or from 2 to 10, somewhere around 6, somewhere in this range. If we observe values of x tot far away from this region, then that would be evidence against the null hypothesis. 
So here we have the information that we've been producing for the sign test. We've got instructions here for the TI-84 calculator to construct the sample space for this distribution, the uh, CDF, and then one minus the CDF. And then I've also replicated the graph down there. So we can see here to get a hypothesis test with a significance level of approximately 0.05, preferably no greater than 0.05, then we're going to reject the null hypothesis if x tote is either less than or equal to 2 or greater than or equal to 10. So going back up to uh, the plot here, we can see here that the combined probability of x tote being less than or equal to 2 or greater than or equal to 10 is going to be the sum of those values and that turns out to be uh, 2 times 0 0.0193 or 0 0.0386. So this is not quite 0.05. Uh, if we wanted to go, if, if we set the uh, critical points at 3 and 9, for example, then we would have a significance level that is about 0.146. And so that's going to be much too big. So we're going to have to go with this one. Okay, so if we go back and look at the differences here, Remember that x tote is counting the number of differences that are positive. And so we see we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So the test statistic is equal to 9. The p-value for this test, which is 2 times the probability that x tote is less than or equal to n minus x tote, or 12 minus 9, or less than or equal to 3, that p-value is 0.146. And so we can frame our conclusion using either the test statistic critical point method or using the p-value method. We'll get the same results either way. So since x tote is not less than or equal to 2 and it's not greater than or equal to 10, or equivalently since the p-value is not less than or equal to the attainable significance level of 0 0.0386 but is much larger, 0.146, there is insufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that the median of the distribution is different than zero. So in terms of the original question, we can say that there is insufficient evidence at the 0 0.0386 level of significance to conclude that the machines differ in terms of the distribution of the number of defective parts produced per day. So this is a really interesting application of the sign test. We're comparing two distributions by looking at paired differences condensing this problem down into a single population problem, and we're able to answer a question of interest. Because under the conditions of the null hypothesis, the distribution of the paired differences is symmetric, in fact symmetric about zero, we can apply the Wilcox and side rank test. We don't have to worry about asymmetry, because under the conditions of the null hypothesis, that distribution of paired differences will be symmetric. The null hypothesis is that the distribution of differences is symmetric about zero. The alternative is that the distribution of differences has some other median. The test statistic, because this is a two-tailed test, the test statistic t is the minimum of t minus and t plus. And then we now have to come up with the rejection criteria. Now remember that because of the way the table we're using to get critical points from the uh, Wilcox and Sign Rank test, because of the way that table is structured, all of these tests involving the Wilcoxon are left tail tests. All right, so here is a portion of the table, table A9, and we know that we've got a sample size of 12, and we're performing a two-sided or two-tailed test. The desired significance level is 0 0.05, and so according to this table, the appropriate critical point is 14. All right, so the rejection criteria is to reject the null hypothesis if our test statistic t is less than 14. Now let's calculate the test statistic, and I'm going to use the same approach I used in the previous lecture where we talked about the Wilcox, and I'm going to structure this in terms of a spreadsheet so that we can see how we go about doing the mechanics involved in calculating the test statistic. So I've got my 12 observations, my 12 days, and what I've entered here are the differences. Now the hypothesized value of the median in this case is zero, in general, if it was something other than zero, we would subtract that off. But, uh, so the values in this column are obviously uh, the same as the values in the difference column. Then we have to take the absolute value 
of those differences, or those deviations, of the difference and then uh, minus zero. Okay, so here we have the absolute value of those deviations. Okay, the next step is to create an ascending data array based on or containing these absolute values. Right. And so here uh, I have ordered those differences from smallest to largest, creating an ascending data array. Then the next step is to assign the ranks. Now we need to be careful. Notice that we've got several repeated values, several common values. So we've got uh, sevens here, we've got four eights, two nines. And so uh, the way that we assign the ranks is we assign to those uh, observations that have the same absolute value here, we assign them the average of the rank positions that they take up. And so these first two observations have positions one and two, and so their ranks would be the average of one and two, so one plus two over two. These four observations have the same absolute value of eight, and so the ranks associated with those would be the average of positions three, four, five, and six, and so forth. And so in doing that, here are the ranks that we would assign. Once we have those, we need to attach the sign to the rank to get our assigned ranks. All right, so this rank is associated with a negative difference, so its signed rank is negative 4.5. This 7.5 here uh, is associated with a negative difference, and so it gets a negative in front of it, and so forth. Then what I'm going to do is put the absolute values of the negative ranks in this column, and the values of the positive ranks in that column, and then calculate the column total. And so we get T minus, which is 19.5, and T plus, which is 58.5. And so the value of the test statistic, which is the minimum of T minus and T plus, is 19.5. All right, once we have that, we can draw our conclusion. Since 19.5 is not less than our critical point of 14, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. And so there is insufficient evidence at the point 0, 0.05 level of significance to conclude that the median difference in the number of defectives produced by the two machines is different than zero. And so in terms of the original question, again, there is insufficient evidence at the point 0, 0.05 level of significance to conclude that the machines differ in terms of the distribution of the number of defective parts produced per day. Now, we have been performing these tests by hand the sign test, and the Wilcox and sign rank test. The sign test is not too difficult to do by hand, but the Wilcox and sign rank test is a bit more cumbersome. It takes a bit more work. I think it's probably about time that we start, let's look at some uh, how to do these analyses in a software package, and we're gonna be using SAS. It's very simple in SAS. And so here is a SAS program that I'm using to analyze this data. Most of this program is doing some initial housekeeping up here on the top and then creating a SAS data set to contain the data. The SAS code to request the sign test and uh, the Wilcox assigned rank test is down here at the very bottom. In fact, we don't even have to tell it to do those two tests. We're invoking PROC Univariate down here at the very bottom. And PROC Univariate, by default, will do not only t-tests and things like that, but it will also produce the sign test and the results of the Wilcox and signed rank test. And it does that regardless of whether those tests are applicable. There are some situations that the t-test is not applicable. There are going to be some situations where the Wilcox and signed rank test is not applicable, but it produces those results regardless. And then we have to be smart consumers of that information but in order to do this test, this is all we have to do. And notice here that one option I have added here is this option location equal to zero. And so what this is going to do in doing the uh, sign test and the Wilcox and signed rank test, it's going to test the hypothesis that the median of the population from which uh, these data come, and in particular, in this case, the median of the population of differences is equal to whatever value you've got specified right here. And so you can see here that it's going to test the hypothesis that the median is zero. Now, the default value is zero. So technically, I would not have to include this. All right, it would do it by default. But if we were going to perform a test where we're testing that the median is some other value, like we did when we were looking at the sign test and the Wilcox and signed rank test for testing the median of a single population, then we could change that value, set it to something else, 
and it would do the appropriate test. Okay, now here, this is the section of the output from Proc Univariate where it's giving us the results for the sign test and the Wilcox and signed right test. So this second row here, these are the results for the sign test. And you see here that we get the same exact p-value that we calculated by hand on the TI-84 calculator, 0 0.1460. The value of the statistic that they're reporting is different than x tot, the value we calculated. All right, we don't need to worry about that. It's just using a different version of a test statistic. It's using something a little bit different than the way we calculate it, but uh, the test that they're performing is equivalent. It's the same as the test that we're performing, and we can see that because the p-value is the same. Then in the last row, we have the output, the results for the Wilcoxon signed rank test. And at least for this example, you'll see that the test statistic is the value that we got. Now, one thing that we get from this result that we don't get by using the table is we get the actual p-value for the test. And so we see here that the p-value for this test is 0.1377, all right? And so immediately from these results here, see that we would not reject the null hypothesis at the 0.05 level of significance. Now, let me just point out, notice here that it's telling us what it's testing. It's testing the null hypothesis, what it's calling mu sub zero, which we interpret in this context to be the median of this population of differences, that that median is zero. The alternative to that is that the median is not zero. So that is a two-tailed test. And so these p-values are all, all three of these p-values here, uh, the p-value for the t-test as well as the signed, uh, the, the signed test and the Wilcox and signed rank test, those are all two-tailed p-values. Now that's appropriate because that's what we're testing. Right? But if we happen to be testing a one-sided alternative, then we would have to do something about that. But I just wanted to point that out. Now, what about this t-test? Look at the p-value for that t-test. That p-value is a lot smaller than these, so it looks like we've got a more powerful testing situation here using the t-test. And in fact, based on that p-value, we would reject the null hypothesis at the point 05 level of significance. So can we use that? Well, we need to take a look at the distribution of the sample of differences and see if we see any evidence of non-normality. Because remember, the t-test is based on an assumption that the data, in this case the paired differences, are normally distributed, or at least approximately so, and so they would need to be unimodal and symmetric. We see here that the histogram of the differences is unimodal, but it does appear to be some asymmetry. Now, just out of curiosity, would you say that it's exhibiting positive skewness or right skewness, or negative skewness, which is left skewness? This may seem surprising. This is the calculation of the sample skewness produced by Proc Univariate, and we see here that we've actually got negative skewness. So, it, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. I was a little bit surprised by that. I would have said that we've got some right skewness here, but it can be hard to tell from a histogram like this, especially when the sample size is small. Okay, but anyway, we do see that we've, we've got some skewness associated with this sample, and if we perform a test of normality, so the assumption here, the null hypothesis, is that the uh, population of differences from which this sample is obtained is normally distributed against the alternative that the population of differences is not normally distributed. SAS will give us four tests, and we see that there's not complete agreement here, but the uh, Kolmogorov-Smirnov test does indicate non-normality. While these other p-values are not quite as small, they are trending in that direction, so there is some evidence of non-normality of these differences, and so we should be a bit hesitant in using the results of a t-test. So even though that looks very appealing, very attractive to us, we probably ought to not use that because there's evidence of non-normality. But even though we're not using the t-test, we do have these other tests that we can, we can use. So that's the end of this example. Now we're going to look at another example. This is another real-world example. This is a comparison of wound repair methods. And so the data below are tensile strength measurements of tape-closed and suture-closed wounds obtained on 10 rats, taken 40 days after two incisions, were made on their backs and they had been closed, one by traditional suture and the other by a new surgical tape. 
The purpose of the study was to determine whether the new tape closure method results in stronger wound tensile strengths. So the question of interest, is there sufficient evidence at a level of significance equal or at least close to 0.05 to conclude that the tape closure method results in stronger wound tensile strengths? And so again, we have the tensile strengths measured on each rat of the tape closed wound and the suture closed wound for each of the 10 rats. And then I've, got, I've calculated the difference uh, between these, taking the tape tensile strength measurement minus the suture tensile strength measurement. Since each rat had two incisions, one closed by a traditional suture and the other closed by the new surgical tape, the two sets of tensile strength measurements are paired and therefore dependent. Clearly, a comparison procedure that assumes independent samples would not be appropriate in this situation. Rather, a procedure that allows for and accounts for this dependence ought to be used. Now, if the null hypothesis is true, then the distribution of the differences in suture tensile strengths will have median zero, which can be tested by the sign test. In addition, under the null hypothesis, the distribution will be symmetric, and hence the Wilcoxon signed rank test will be appropriate as well. Therefore, both of these tests will be used to make this comparison by analyzing the paired differences. And then we will compare the results that we get from these two tests. Okay, so we're going to start off by using the sign test. And so again, if the null hypothesis is true, then the distribution of the differences in suture tensile strengths will be symmetrically distributed and distributed about zero. Hence, a test about the median, cap M, of the population of differences in tensile strengths can be used to test this hypothesis, this comparison of the two wound repair methods. So again, we're going to be using the sign test. So the null hypothesis is that cap M is less than or equal to zero. This is true if the tape closure method is no better than the suture closure method. The alternative hypothesis is that the median of the population of differences is positive, it's greater than zero, and so this would correspond to the situation where the tape closure method is better than the suture closure method. Now, if the boundary condition of the null hypothesis is true, then the test statistic is going to have a binomial distribution with n equal to 10 and p equal to 0.5, and so that sampling distribution, sampling distribution of x tote, will be symmetric about uh, its mean of 5. And the next slides show important information about the sampling distribution. And so again, here is the sampling distribution. So if the null hypothesis is true, and in particular if that boundary condition is true, then we would expect to see values of x tote around 5. That's the mean of its sampling distribution. Since this is a right tail test, we're looking for large values of x tote that would lead us to reject the null hypothesis. And so based on this, we can see that we would reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative if x tote is either, well, what would you pick? Would you pick greater than or equal to 9 or greater than or equal to 8? Okay, here we have the instructions for the TI-84 to construct the sample space and the CDF for this reference distribution, and then 1 minus the CDF. And we can see here that if we choose a value of x tote greater than 7, then that would give us a significance level of just a little bit over 0.05. Okay, so again, if we use the criterion reject the null hypothesis if x tote is greater than 7, then the test will have an actual significance level of 0.0547. If we use the criterion, reject the null hypothesis if x tote is greater than 8, then the test will have an actual significance level of 0 0.0107. Now that's a little bit too small. We want something close to 0.05. It would be great if we could get something close to 0.05 and not greater than 0.05. This 0.0547 is a little bit bigger, but it's not too much bigger. So let's go with that test. All right, so if we go back up to the data here, and in particular the differences, we see we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight positive differences. So x tote is equal to eight, and so the p value of the test is 0 0.0547. And so the results are significant at the 0 0.0547 level. They're not significant at the 0 0.05 level, but we can't attain that because of the discreteness of this reference distribution, but we can get a significant result at a 0 0.0547 level. So in terms of the original question, we can say there is sufficient evidence 
at the point 0547 level of significance to conclude that the tape closure method results in greater wound tensile strength than the traditional suture method. I see autocorrect has got me again, All right, so I'll have to fix that. All right, so it's magic how that happens, but it got fixed. Now let's use the Wilcoxon signed rank test. And again, we know that the uh, Wilcoxon signed rank test is applicable here because we know that under the conditions of the null hypothesis, the population of differences is symmetrically distributed. So the null hypothesis is that the distribution of tensile strength differences is symmetric about a value cap m that's less than or equal to zero. And the alternative is that the distribution of differences is symmetric about a value cap m that's greater than zero. The uh, test statistic is t minus. The rejection criteria, well, again, because of the way this table is set up, every test we do is going to be a left-tailed test. All right, so we need to go to the table to see what that critical point is going to be. All right, we have a sample size of 10. We're performing a one-sided test, and we want to use a significance level of 0 0.05. And so that means that the critical point is going to be 11. And so we're going to reject the null hypothesis if our test statistic, t equal to t negative, t minus, is less than 11. So now, again, we need to calculate the value of the test statistic, so we're going to do it in the context of this spreadsheet. And again, this is not the only way to do this. You know, you may come up with a different way uh, of calculating this um, that you're more comfortable with, and perhaps you can do it by hand just by looking at it. All right, but I do, I do like to lay it out this way because it helps to organize the work and it shows the workflow in calculating the test statistic. Okay, so I've entered the data, the differences actually, for the 10 rats, and then in the next column we calculate the deviation from uh, each of these differences and the hypothesized or proposed value of the median, which again is zero. Then in the next column we take the absolute values of those deviations, and then once we uh, have done that, we need an ascending data array of these absolute deviations and then assign ranks. So here I've sorted the uh, spreadsheet based on that column. Scanning down, I don't see any repeated values, and so it's going to be very easy to calculate the ranks in this case. Then to each rank, we associate or attach the sign of the deviation, and so then we have the signed ranks. And then I'm going to collect the negative ranks here in this column, the positive ranks in that column, and calculate the column totals. And so I have T minus being equal to 8, T plus being equal to 47. Oh, and by the way, note that their sum, which is 55, is equal to N times N plus 1 over 2. So 10 times 11 over 2, all right, which is 55. And so that's a good quality control check to make sure that we've done everything correct in our spreadsheet. Okay, so the test statistic is equal to 8, and so since the test statistic is less than 11, we reject the null hypothesis. And so based on this test, there is sufficient evidence at the point 05 level of significance to conclude that the median difference in tensile strengths is greater than zero. Now, let me just point out that based on the table that we got the critical point from, if we wanted a test at a point 025 level of significance, and let me just scroll back up here real quick. If we wanted to perform this one-sided test at a significance level of point 025, then the critical point would be 8. Since 8 is not less than 8, we would fail to reject using that critical point. And so it would seem here, based on this, that the test is almost but not quite significant at the point 025 level of significance. Now, I just wanted to point that out because when we go to the SAS output, we're going to see something that leads us to think a little differently. Okay, in terms of the original question, though, there is sufficient evidence at the point 05 level of significance to conclude that the new tape closure method results in stronger wound tensile strengths than the traditional suture method. Also, I want to point out that the Wilcox and Signed Rank Test gives a more significant result than the sign test because we see that it's almost significant at the point 025 level, but not quite. Uh, in fact, it is significant at the 0.05 level. The sign test was not quite. Remember that its p-value was 0 0.054 something or other. So we're seeing in this situation that the Wilcox and signed rank test is giving us a result that is more significant than the sign test. Again, we're going to use SAS to perform the sign test as well as the Wilcox and the signed rank test.
And we're also going to do the t-test in this particular example. So again, here is the SAS code for performing this analysis. Again, the vast majority of the code here is for just doing some initial housekeeping, inputting the data into a SAS data set so that we can analyze it. Oh, and also note, I'm utilizing some macro variables here. Those are helpful sometimes. And then the SAS code to do the analysis is just right here. I'm just invoking proc univariate. All right, I'm again specifying the hypothesized value of the median is zero. And also, and I didn't point this out last time, but I am this time, but notice that I've got the normal test option here on the invocation of proc univariate. This is uh, the code that you include to tell proc univariate to uh, check the assumption of normality. And so we're going to get that output and look at that as well. Okay, now here are the results for the signed test and for the Wilcox and signed rank test. The p-value that it reports here for the sign test is 0.1094, and the p-value for the uh, Wilcox and signed rank test is 0.0488. And those are different than what we calculated when we calculated the p-value of the sign test. We calculated something different. Well, remember that these are two-tailed p-values. These are p-values for a two-tailed test. And so in order to translate that into a one-sided test, we're going to divide them by two. Right, so that's what I'm saying here. The tests performed by SAS by default are two-tailed tests, not one-tailed tests. And so in order to get the p-values for our one-tailed test, we're going to divide these by two. And so the p-value for the sign test, 0 0.1094 divided by two, 0 0.0547. That's exactly what we got. Then the p-value for the Wilcox and signed rank test, 0 0.0488 divided by two. Right, so we take that value, divide by two and we get 0 0.0244. Now, I want to point out a couple things. Number one, notice that the p-value for the Wilcox and Science Rank Test is only about half of the p-value for the Science Test. And so, in this case, we're seeing very clear evidence that the Wilcox and Science Rank Test is quite a bit more powerful than the Science Test in this situation. In looking at the test for normality, we've got these four tests, and we see that none of the p-values are small. And so there's no evidence that the distribution of differences from which this sample is obtained is not normally distributed. And so the t-test would be appropriate to use in this situation. So the p-value for the t-test is 0 0.0467. Now remember that's a two-sided p-value, so the p-value for the one-sided test that we're performing would be 0 0.0234. Now we compare that to the p-value for the Wilcox and Signed Rank Test, which is 0 0.0244. Very, very similar. They're very close. And so while the sign test, the sign th that first test that we looked at, we know the sign test suffers from lower power than the Wilcox. But what we're seeing here is that in some situations, the Wilcox and Signed Rank Test rivals the t-test in terms of power. There's really no difference here in terms of the power between the Wilcox and signed rank test and the uh, paired t-test. Now, the other thing that I want to point out here, I mentioned this previously, is that that critical value obtained from table 8.9 would appear to indicate that the Wilcox and signed rank test is not significant at the 0 0.025 level of significance. Remember that the critical point for that level of significance was 8, right? And our test statistic was 8, so it's not less than the critical point, so we would fail to reject at the point 0 0.025 level of significance, indicating that the result is not significant at that level. However, this uh, p-value, 0 0.0244, is less than 0 0.025, and so based on this p-value, we would reject at the lower level of 0 0.025. Now the difference is, it's just due to the nature of the table. This is more exact, this is more correct. The critical points in that table have to be whole numbers. They're restricted to being whole numbers. And so therefore, while they're close, they can only be approximate. So we do need to keep that in mind. If we do have access to software that calculates p-values, as SAS does, then we may get a slightly different result in terms of what is considered to be significant or not compared to what we would get in using a table. So we just need to understand that. Okay, so that is the end of this example.
And I think that you're really going to find these techniques useful. We can use the sign test and the Wilcox and sign rank test not only to test hypotheses about the meeting of a single population, but we can also, when we're doing experiments that involve paired observations on experimental units, we can utilize these techniques in comparing treatments. When both treatments are done on every experimental unit and we have these paired observations, we can transform the problem from a problem involving two populations down into a problem involving a single population by taking those paired differences and analyzing the resulting data set. And if there are characteristics of the data that make a t-test not applicable, so for example if there's quite a bit of skewness or maybe a heaviness in the tails, high kurtosis, that would render the t-test inappropriate, then we can still use the sign test and the Wilcox and sign rank test. And preferably, you know, we would use the Wilcox and sign rank test because it's uh, in general more powerful than the sign test. And we've also seen that in, in situations, the Wilcox and sign rank test can rival the t-test in terms of power. And so in those situations where a t-test is not applicable, the Wilcox and sign rank test is a very, very attractive technique to use. So that's the end of this video and we'll meet up again in the next video.